Good morning, everyone. Blessings to all of you today for our Holy Communion service um, on AGM Day as well. So we've got that following with a lunch. So there'll be more announcements about that. But it's my just great pleasure to, uh, to say that Kong will be leading pretty much all of the service, apart from a few little bits today. So it's a great blessing for him to do that um, as part of his uh, formation, um, looking at ordination this year. So that's very, very exciting. So it is wonderful to both be here to serve you and to deliver Christ's gifts to you today. Just on a note, we are also um, in Job in terms of our preaching. So we're looking forward to the second part of our preaching series and also Bible study series on Job. And um, I know there's lots in that book to speak to us as a congregation and also as a community. So be blessed, everyone, and enjoy the service today. And I'll just hand over to Colm. Opening sentence. The message about the cross is a fullness to those who are patient. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We can sing the songs. Sorry, three, yep.
let us confess together. Almighty God, we make a and redeemer. We confess to you by the nature and by sinful and unclean. And that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. That you have mercy on us and for us, drive us to grant us forgiveness of our sins. sins. By, by the Holy Spirit, increase our knowledge of our you and your will. And, and make us obedient to your word, so, so that by the grace we can do our eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Fathers, as compassion on us and give us his one and only Son to die for us. As a dear lovely children of God, I have known that the wonderful grace and God to all of you, that our Lord Jesus Christ forgive us all our sin. In the name of the Fathers and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, peace be with you all. Amen. So, first of that. Thank you, Kong. Well, dear friends, we're going to sing Psalm 19. And we have some newer for us. I uh, haven't done a newer psalm for a little while. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through the words, just for pronunciation. And um, hopefully it's correct. And Kong has always been very helpful um, in terms of pronunciation. So our refrain is, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. So I've put it in phonetically for us so we can get the hang of it. So these are the words. Lat pua goi quat. Together. Lat pua goi quat. And the next line is Nial la de technique. Nial la de technique. So you've got it perfectly. Look at that. You're getting really good. All right, I reckon you're going to be okay with that. So I'm just going to sing it through and, and pick up the tune. goes out into all the earth their words to the end of the world Lat pua goi quat ni ala te tet ni ke The law of the Lord is perfect refreshing for refreshing the soul the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Lat pua goi kwa. The judgments of the Lord are true and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, much more than the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, 
Then honey straight from the honeycomb Lad pua goi kwan Mi alate take me Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now will be forevermore Amen La Pua Goi Mi Alente The first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, starting at the first verse. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waves below, in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for their sin of the parents of the third generation and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animal, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in it, that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord of your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or do donkey or anything but that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Gospel reading. John is 10. John chapter 2, verse 13. 
uh, to 22. Jesus cleaned the tables and gave the signs. When it was almost time for the first, for the, for the Jews' Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple court. He found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sat sitting at tables, exchanging money. So he met, wept out of court, and dove all from the table, temple, court, both sheep and cattle as escalated. The coin of the money charged and overturned their table. To those who sold doves, he said, get this out of, of here. It stopped turning my father's eight hours into the market. His disciple remembered that. It is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The, the Jews then responded to him, what signs can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy these temples and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple has had spoken of what is body. After he was raising from the dead, his disciple recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus has spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. You can first Apostle Creed and talk now last name Yeshu. I believe in the power of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. In the third day he rose again from the kitchen, and he said unto the devil, He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. From then he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Catholic, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, everyone. Dear friends, our message today is based on Job chapters 3 to 21. And thankfully, I'm not going to give you chapters 3 to 21 because it's quite a lot to get through. However, I have a particular section which I think helps us get a handle on this next part of Job. So I'm just going to read that to you. And we're looking today at the friends, the friends that come to Job's aid to comfort him but end up being uh, quite difficult for Job to cope with. So this is a response uh, from Job uh, about what he's going through and also a response from Bildad, one of the friends uh, to Job's lament. So let me read that to you. Therefore I will not keep silent. I will speak out in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the monster of the deep that you put me under guard? When I think my bed will comfort me and my couch will ease my complaint, even then you frighten me with dreams and you terrify me with visions. So that I prefer strangling in death rather than this body of mine. I despise my life. I would not live forever. Let me alone, my days have no meaning. 
What is mankind that you make so much of them, that you give them so much attention, that you examine them every morning and test them every moment? Will you never look away from me, nor let me alone even for an instant? If I have sinned, what have I done to you who see everything we do? Why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? And why do you not pardon my offences and forgive my sins? For I will soon lie down in the dust. You will search for me, but I will be no more. And then Bildad the Shuite replied, How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous your future will be. Grace and peace to all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, today's message is part two of our preaching series on Job. And for those very fresh to the content or those needing a recap of the story so far, today is the part where the three friends who come together around our central character, Job, And they show up to discuss with him the meaning of his trauma and his suffering and what it says about God, sin, and also sin's connection to bad things that can happen. Now, Job was introduced last week as the greatest man of the East, a story possibly set in the time after Abraham. He's got 10 children, an abundance of animals and wealth and servants, and is declared by our narrator and also by God as a man who is blameless, upright, who fears God and turns away from evil. However, in the spiritual realm, in the story, we're given a glimpse of Satan who approaches God in the heavenly council and he wants to test God, test Job. And so he is permitted in one fell swoop to attack Job. He destroys his wealth, his property, And all his children are killed instantly by a mighty wind which blows a house down on top of them all. And in a further test, the sufferings increase to the layer of Job's body, with him receiving painful, blistering sores all over him. And in his grief, shock and despair about all this loss, remarkably, his faith in God is still still standing. But today, we begin to look at the final assault on Job, his deepest, deepest layer. And that is through these three friends who are unconsciously used as Satan's instruments to shoot arrows into his soul, to ultimately wound his theology and his relationship with God. Now, arrows, as it happens, as metaphors, feature several times in the book of Job. As Job complains to God himself in 7 verse 20, we had the beginning of our slides. Why have you made me your target? And this is one of the many why questions that Job asks, especially those in chapter 3 of his major lament, which his three friends hear in his presence. And Job believes he has enough arrows of suffering as it is from what has happened to him. But what is so striking difficult about these chapters, if you read through Job from chapters 4 to 21, is the way in which his friends wound Job all the more with their words. Now, either they're perceived by Job as further arrows entering his soul, or more likely the case, they are well-meaning friends trying to help Job, and they're trying to actually remove the arrows, which, of course... None of you have ever had an arrow in you, but you've seen on movies, haven't you? Where people have arrows in them and 
well-meaning colleagues try and pull the arrows out is extremely painful, isn't it? Often makes the wound much worse. Now you see these three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they're most likely rich and wealthy, like Job was. And they have various schools of wisdom on the subject of suffering and also God. And they try and apply that to Job, but they do it in the wrong way and in the wrong time, according to the level of distress that Job is under. They try to apply reason and theology in pretty terrible ways, let's be honest. Whilst Job, he is still emotional. He's in a very highly sensitive and traumatized state. And there's a phrase that comes from the teaching profession, which is quite relevant here. Kids don't learn when their hair is on fire. Don't know if you've ever heard that before, but I like it. It helps understand something about children who are spending a lot of their energy trying to be safe, trying to be emotionally stable because they're, whether depending on their background or whatever they're going through, they're having enough time trust trying to manage their own body and manage their own feelings. Now these kids, when they're very agitated, they can't learn. No child learns, let alone adults. We're exactly the same, isn't it? We don't take in information when we're upset or when we're agitated or when we're stressed seems to sort of go past us and there's really good neurological reasons for that. But of course, when people feel safe and they feel calm, of course, the doors open and they're ready to receive language and receive new information. And this is really interesting when it comes to Job because his three, three friends are trying to apply logic and reason to Job, who's actually not really in the place to try and handle all that. But funny enough, remarkably, he does. He does rise up to them in quite amazing ways. But as these friends try and tell Job what the problem is, and this is how you're going to fix it, Job is more or less exclaiming in disbelief about how unhelpful they are being. And so as Job is lamenting his loss and he has a lot of raw feelings about what he's gone through, these friends are like stern, emotionless school teachers, giving him a good lecture or two, giving him lessons on God's justice and how God deals with hidden sins. Aha, that must, according to them, be lurking somewhere secretly in Job's family for all of this disaster to have happened. And you see, rather than meeting Job in his pain and suffering with compassion, it's actually really incredulous to see how many times they tried to push his pain under the carpet. And they keep telling Job that God is all about justice and prosperity for those who do right. And if you do wrong, well, sorry, disaster, what happens to you? If you sin, you open up the doors to God's justice. You're going to suffer. Sorry, Job. I reckon something's happened to you that you're not telling us. But also from these three friends, they have also want to say to Job, hey, there are new blessings all ready to go for you, Job, if you just fess up, if you just confess what the problem is, what you're hiding. Because we've got a God of prosperity here. He wants to bless you. He wants to make everything right again. He wants to do all of these really good things in your life. If only you would confess your sin and you get to the bottom of this problem. There's a term that has been described for the friends. They're called theologians of glory. Theologians of glory. Not theologians of suffering or the cross, but of glory. Everything about what they're saying is about good things. Not about pain, not about suffering, but just about what God's got in store for you if we get rid of this very painful thing that we're going through. And they're promising riches too, and a good life. And these friends hope that Job, 
after this little bit of sadness, he will get back on the horse and be restored once again. For them, this is very uncomfortable setback. And if this were happening in our time, I was trying to picture who Job might be and his friends, what they would be associated with. And I reckon they'd all be members of the golf club. <laughs> Playing golf every Saturday, all day, and talking. And they're rich and they're wealthy. And they all those sorts of things. And you see... Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they just believe that it's only a matter of time before Job is back to normal and he can chair the annual golf club dinner. However, these friends don't take kindly to Job's protests because he protests against their words. And after all, they're just trying to help. Job calls them miserable comforters. And he says, you, you smear me with lies. You are all worthless physicians, the lot of you. If only you would be altogether silent. Well, later on, Job says, how long will you torture me and crush me with words? And this is my personal favorite in chapter 21. Bear with me while I speak. And after I've finished, mock on. <laughs> But what are these friends doing that is so wrong? At a basic level, they have a consistent pattern of speaking. They have an order to things, but they, they speak without compassion. They firstly accuse and critique Job about his words and his, uh, and his situation. And then they offered their considered advice and wisdom and then they always seem to finish with a conditional promise that things will work out for you and you have a bright future, Job, that awaits. So in other words, if you do such and such, then blessing and security will naturally follow. However, they seem somehow blissfully unaware of the words that they use and how they could be traumatic to the ears, to the ears of a distressed person. Do you remember I mentioned that Job's children were crushed to death by a strong wind that destroyed the house? Well, both Eliphaz and Bildad use words such as wind and crushed in their sentences, especially when Job's long complaints are getting to them. They, they talk about Job's speeches as the hot east wind by his friends. But several times, and this is the tricky stuff, the, this is shocking things here. Several times these words are coupled with the mention of his kids. He says, his children are far from safety, crushed in court without a defender. And this from Bildad. Your words, Job, are a blustering wind. When your children sinned, when they sinned against God, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. And to add further injury, Eliphaz also claims to, be a, to be, have been visited by a spirit in the night that makes him tremble with his hair standing on end, and that has given him extra special wisdom and revelation to apply to Job's case. And later on, poor Job, he complains to God about this. And he says that even the one single comfort of his bed, the one safe place that could ease his complaint, that could ease his suffering somewhat, is now compromised by a fear of having terrible visions and dreams in the night. Poor Job, he can't go anywhere without being attacked. Can you see how his sense of safety has been undermined by these three, three friends? And so the more you read about these friends and what they say, the more that you see that a bit of poison yeast has spread through the whole dough and becomes clear that their counsel has been corrupted and spiritually used to hurt and wound Job, Job in his faith. And next week, we see how Job's friends get quite heated and annoyed with Job and how it becomes a conflict of words in certain places. But if you were to do a review of the three friends, 
That's particularly Bildad. But if you had to do a, let's take up those words of worthless phys physicians. Let's say they're doctors, because they're trying to be doctors, aren't they? How would you rate Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad on ratemygp.com? <laughs> What would you give them out of 10? I'd give them a, yeah, I'd give them a three, four from Ray, any, any, any lower than that? <laughs> Pretty terrible stuff. So in other words, folks, don't go to Bill Dad for therapy. He'll screw you up pretty bad, I think. However, despite the spiritual onslaught, and as, the, and as a reader, it's hard going. Hard going through Job. And quite exhaustive in places. But Job comes up for air. And this stand verses, these verses stand like a bright light in the book. He comes up for air to show that his faith is still there. It's still alive and well. It's survived the first few rounds of spiritual attack. And these are the words from chapter 19. And you'll recognize them from Handel's Messiah, if you love that piece of music by Handel. It says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. These verses point beyond Job's circumstances. In fact, they point to a future of human eyes seeing God in the flesh, in Christ. Job's desire to actually see God is very strong. And if you think about it, given all the attacks that he's gone through and the perceptions of God that have been twisted and distorted by his friends... Job desperately needs that remnant of faith in him to hang on to something special, like a visit from the Lord. You see, there's a part of Job that never gave in to the assault of Satan and his three friends. And he has confidence that God will one day come and reveal himself as an act of grace. And when we suffer, it is difficult to hang on to God and often we want him to show up and deliver us in some way. It's good to know that God has us in his hands, though, and he knows what specific sign or comfort, um, especially from his word, that we need to know so that we have an awareness that he is there and that he cares. The other thing I like about Job is that he displays of a lot of courage. You have to admire him for refusing to stay quiet about what's happened to him. That opening verse of today, I will not keep silent. I will speak out in the anguish of my spirit. This is what we encourage all trauma sufferers to do, actually. Speak. Speak and share the pain of what they feel and not to bury the pain and pretend everything's all okay. This doesn't mean that anyone needs to relive the actual distressing events themselves that have happened and speak about their trauma over and over and over again to doctors and friends. You'd be surprised how many people have to relive what's happened to them by telling new people all the time. But instead, we encourage people to speak about its effects on them, how it is manifesting day to day for them, how they survive each day, how they live, how they get up in the morning, how they go to work, how they do the washing up, how do they get through their normal tasks when they're hurting that bad? And this is where we come in, or you come in, as Christ himself. Come as Christ to the sufferer with compassion, open to feel what they feel, but displaying strength and safety so that the person sees that their troubles will not overwhelm us. And we're not to become Job's friends. But the reality is that we so easily do. Especially when we have very little time to hear someone's hurt or complaint. Or we find that their pain is way too uncomfortable for us. 
And sometimes our friends who have suffered grief, loss and trauma, they can take a long time to heal. And many of them can remain trapped in their grief, making us Job's friends when we want to snap them out of it, to stop being a victim and move on in life. But lastly, friends, in Christ, to sit with the sufferer is not about saying nothing, but more about being non-anxious and present. That says in both kind and sensitive words and gestures, God is with you. He suffers with you. He is your strength, and he will work through the pain to bring you through into his deliverance so that you can survive the current day And then one day at a time, you will feel his safety once again. We can also pray spiritual protection for them and for ourselves. To have the wisdom to see that spiritual things of the evil one can play a part. But we also know that the evil one is a defeated foe. And whatever trauma and suffering that he tries to sow, whatever isolation he tries to create... Nothing can stop our strong God from rescuing and restoring us in his timing. For we know indeed, don't we, that our Redeemer lives to the glory of his name. Amen. Dear friends, we're going to sing our next song. Um, Thy strong word did cleave the darkness. And as we sing, your offerings will be received.
opening prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you give to us. So gracious in our days, all we have and all we have has come from you. So we worship you with our offering today and ask you to use this gift for the blessing of your church. Amen. 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 Dear friends, we invite you to bow your heads in prayer as we pray uh, a prayer. Uh, the first part of it is based on the Ten Commandments. So Ten Commandments are a great way to base our prayers around a lovely structure. So we're going to pray that to start with as we also pray for our community and also our church. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have commanded us to have no other gods and keep us faithful to you alone and dethrone the idols in our lives. Holy God, your name is holy and you place it on us in our baptism. Help us keep it pure and use it properly in prayer and praise. Lord God, our creator and redeemer, you created six days for work and the seventh to enjoy your holy rest. And help us use the Lord's day to rest in you by hearing and growing in your word. And Father, help all parents bring up their children to love and honour you and build our children's love for and obedience of their parents and all in rightful authority. Lord of life, build respect among all people for the world and the life you create. Let us do nothing to hurt or harm our neighbour in any way, but move us to help in times of need. Lord, you have also established marriage and you continue to bless it for our good. Give us grace to lead a pure life with others and to help those who are married to remain faithful to each other with patience and forgiveness. Almighty God, you su supply the needs, sorry, you supply the things that we need for daily life and the work by which we obtain them. Help us to contribute to each other's well-being by sharing our possessions with those in need. And also, Lord, prevent us from doing anything to damage our neighbour's reputation. Make us more ready to forgive than to judge and to keep us from angry outbursts and malicious talk. And Lord, Please bless us with contentment in all that you've given us. Make us good stewards of all your gifts and give us a generous and joyful heart in serving our neighbour. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And Lord, in our own community, we also pray for those who are suffering and those with sickness, continued illness and deterioration, recovering from surgery, and also those receiving specific medical care. And we pray for the family of Elizabeth Leake and for the Sudanese community for the funeral that is coming this Saturday. And we also pray for Carl, for David, for Barry, and for Horst, and for Scott, and also for Kong and Tabisa and Michael Nilat and their whole families. And also all those who are waiting very patiently for your help and your strength in all their needs. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Kwan <laughs> I can't tell you how much I'm going to be able to do it. 
Tiko malu ho vya kam ko jin. Yaka jila te loa koro ko sukui ko ali tsibin kani lizbeish. Aika jen oi chako te keel kani lizbeish ko ukit paz ko chine po jinen. A jog a baby, take a young civet back at the finger, a point there, back all as moon. Take a young upon the album of post, Connay like your money, Connay lumber nicker, Connay like you dwell called with your care. You go more bomb, could mala a gin, could be guard cavara, you go boom. The care elder Stephen, the other tent in court mala or Nijin and Vier. Be a new drop and go on again, the drop do. Louis Niger, a king, a do me take the new one. Long look and look, you be a call, go, should you call me deed. Dear Heavenly Father, hear our prayers today through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Well, that is fitting and right. It is indeed right and good, Lord God, Holy Father, that we should all at all times and all places give thanks to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has taken on himself our sin, so that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. And so with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heavens, we adore and praise your glory name. Holy, 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 holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The Lord Frail. Our Father in heaven, Allah be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. So every time we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thanks be to God. Come, everything is ready.
please rise. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life eternal. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we we give you thanks that you have fed us through the body and blood of your Son. Lord God, the battle of good and evil rages within and around us. Through this holy meal, strengthen our faith in your Son. And when we fall, raise and restore us. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and all the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Things. May the Christ, our crucified Savior, draw us to himself so that we may find in him the assurance of forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Amen. Anonymous. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Please be seated, everyone. Thanks very much, Colin. Yeah. Nice okay. Good.
Thank you. And uh, Pastor will raise at the door. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Fantastic. Come on, come on. Let's go. Okay. Ich bin ein Schwager, 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 ich bin ein Schwager,